Good morning or good afternoon everyone, depending on where you are joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Rachel Starbuck from the Business Review and I will be your host. It is our pleasure to have Environment One Corporation with us today, who will be discussing preventing catastrophe, detecting and locating generator hotspots. Today's guest speaker is Steve Kilmartin, Director of Products and Markets. I'd like to welcome you to our new webinar platform. You'll notice that this webinar is browser-based, so if you disconnect, please click on the link that you received via email to rejoin. You may move and resize the windows on your screen to customize your view. All of the icons along the bottom of your screen are the interactive widgets that we have on offer today, so please do interact with them all throughout the session. In order to ask questions, you can send them in via the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen, or please use the top left-hand box. We will allocate around 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the session to address any questions or thoughts that you may have. Please use the help widget if you experience any technical difficulties or require any more assistance. So without further ado, please allow me to welcome Steve. Thank you. Rachel, during this webinar, I will discuss hotspot detection in hydrogen and air-cooled generators. Typically, when properly operated, uh, these large synchronous generators are very reliable. However, generators can and do fail. Many generator failure modes are common and can be predicted or prevented. Some examples of why generators can fail are design flaws, operator issues, contamination or foreign objects, because of mechanical and electrical stresses put on the generator. This is a picture of a generator that has uh, some intern vibration issues. Some failures cannot be prevented, but early detection of the problem followed by prompt corrective action can mean the difference between a brief shutdown for minor repairs and a major overall involving weeks or months of costly downtime. This is a picture of a generator that had experienced a core failure. Early detection of this problem could have minimized the damage done to the generator. I'll turn it back to Rachel for this poll question. Okay, thank you, Steve. So are you directly or indirectly responsible for a generator or generator fleet? And your answers are from responsible for generator, responsible for generator fleet, or not responsible. So if you could please click on the answer that is relevant and click on submit. I will just give you a few more seconds to do so. Okay then, so if I move on to the results now. Okay, so Steve, can you comment on these results for me? Well, this is good. It looks like we have quite a few people that are uh, responsible for the generator fleet, which is good. And uh, the percentage-wise, we've got some generator users here. Uh, so I think that they're going to find this uh, webinar very valuable. One, one additional on the generator failures, also today's operating conditions increase the chances of generator failures. Generator fleets are getting older. Periods between outages are getting longer and longer. Generators are being cycled more today versus being base load units, which puts a lot more stress on the generator. The grid is less stable due to the renewable energies that are now tied to the grid. And the power industry workforce is getting leaner. This is a picture of a generator that has intern issues in the rotor. Yeah, 
As I mentioned earlier, this webinar is about hotspot detection in large synchronous generators. I will be dis discussing two different technologies, one for detecting hotspots in hydrogen-cooled generators, which uses an ion chamber as a detector, and one used for detection of hotspots in air-cooled generators, which uses a cloud chamber as the detector. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn this back to Rachel again for uh, another poll question. Thank you, Steve. So are you responsible for a hydrogen-cooled generator, air-cooled generator, or both? So if you could please choose on the answer that is relevant to you and click on Submit. Okay then, so now I'm just going to move on to the results. Okay, so again, Steve, can you make any comments on this for me? Well, well once again, uh, the, the it looks pretty equal uh, for the hydrogen cooled and air cooled, and uh, there's uh, quite a few people that got both, which is which is very good. So, uh, one, once again, I think uh, both parties, uh, whether you've got a hydrogen cooled machine or whether you've got an air cooled machine. Uh, should benefit from this webinar. Generator cooling schemes will vary depending on the size of the generator and the manufacturer of the generator. For example, Alstom and Siemens uh, make some very large air-cooled generators, while General Electric will use hydrogen to cool the same size generator. In this slide, you see that a generator can be cooled by air. And when it's cooled by air, it can be uh, an enclosed system or a once-through system, which we will discuss later. It can be cooled by air and water, where you will have an uh, air-to-water heat exchanger in the unit. Generators can be cooled by hydrogen. Generators can be cooled by hydrogen and water, where the water is used to cool the stator winding of the generator. And then the components in the generator can either be directly cooled, which means the cooling gas comes in contact with the component, or indirectly cooled, where it's, it, the heat transfers through a, another medium inside the generator. And all generators are axial and radially cooled. The next two slides are of sectioned views of generators. And the reason I put these up here is, first of all, to show the, the, the components in the generator. But there's some key elements that I'd like to point out. In this slide, you can see the rotor in the center of the generator. You have the retaining rings on each end of the generator. What you can't see is there's some holes uh, in the middle of the rotor, which are used for the uh, passage of the cooling gas. You can see the, the stator core and then the, the end windings coming out of the stator core. Uh, very important here is the fan that's loaded, located on the right-hand side of the rotor. Uh, this fan is used to circulate the cooling gas inside of the, the generator case. Some generators will have one fan. Some generators will have two fans. Uh, some will use a blower that's... Uh, used to circulate the gas within the generator. And then on this generator, you can see there's some seals on the right-hand side of the rotor to keep the cooling. There's seals on both ends of the generator, which are used to keep the cooling medium inside the generator. This slide is another section view of a generator. The, the reason that I put this slide in here is to show you where the cooling gas is uh, affecting components in the, the generator. The yellow lines that you see are the cooling gas. In this case, it's a hydrogen-cooled generator. 
On the top of the generator, you can see there's a heat, hydrogen to water heat exchanger to remove the heat from the hydrogen. This is a what the, the stator winding in this generator is water cooled. Those red things coming out of the uh, ends of the generator, those are the end windings of the stator winding. You can see the little circles on, on each of those end windings. Those are water passages. That's how the water is fed into the stator winding. The, but the important thing of this is the yellow lines. And the reason I got this up here is because with hotspot detection, wherever those yellow lines are coming in contact with the components of the generator, we are detecting hotspots in those areas. So this hotspot detection is a very global sent, uh, sensor uh, and detects overheating throughout the generator. The following two slides indicate detection equipment used on generators and the conditions they are monitoring. Uh, you can see here fiber optics are used to monitor N-turn vibration. N-turn vibration can be monitored in both hydrogen and air-cooled generators. Vibration sensors are used to monitor the, the rotor. Uh, you can also use uh, vibration sensors to monitor the core, the, uh, the stator, or the frame. The, the N-turn vibra vibration sensors can be used on both air-cooled and uh, gener uh, hydrogen-cooled generators. Partial discharge analyze analyzers, which are used to monitor the integrity of the insulation of the stator winding, again, can be used on both hydrogen and air-cooled generators. Dew point analyzers, which are used to measure the moisture. Now, the moisture content in the cooling gas, these are typically just used on hydrogen-cooled generators. Thermal conductivity analyzer, or a vibrating sensor analyzer, which could be used to monitor the gas purity in the generator. Again, these are only used on hydrogen-cooled generators. Uh, protective relays for electrical overload, these are used on both air and hydrogen cooled generators. And then there's air gap search coil, sometimes referred to as a flux probe, which is used to monitor the rotor winding, look for rotor winding shorts. Radio frequency monitor, similar to a partial discharge analyzer, which is used to monitor for arcing and insulation breakdown. You have temperature sensors, RTDs, and thermocouples. Generators can have as little as two or three RTDs or thermocouples, or on big, uh, bigger generators, you could have 30 or more uh, RTDs or thermocouples. That's a very important piece of information as we go forward with this presentation because sometimes I'm asked the question, I've got RTDs and thermocouples, why do I need a generator condition monitor, and we will be discussing that. And then there's a generator condition monitor, and that's what I'm going to be talking about for both air-cooled and hydrogen-cooled generators, and they're used to detect overheating or arcing in the generator. Both detecting principles I will be discussing are looking for submicron particles or thermal particulates that are created when a material thermally breaks down. Usually in a generator, this is insulating material. Under normal operating conditions, there are no submicron particles in the cooling gas. When a thermal event takes place or a hot spot takes place, you go from having no submicron particles to having millions of submicron particles. And these submicron particles are what we are looking for with these detection devices. This slide shows some materials uh, you will find in a generator and the temperature at which these materials will thermally break down. 
again, most of the materials that you're looking at are insulating materials, core plate, uh, mica tape, epoxy, glass epoxy, uh, varnishes. All, all of, most of, again, are insulating materials. You will note that there's a turbine oil listed on this. You're not supposed to have oil in a generator. However, uh, there are many cases where oil does get in the generator. The reason that this is listed on here is that liquid oil or oil in a mist will not cause, will not show up as a hot spot in the generator. It has to be overheated. And you see that the temperature of what this turbine oil will overheat at is 205 degrees C. So if you have oil in the generator and that oil is on a hot spot or a warm spot in the generator, it will particulate and it will cause an alarm. The last component that you see on this list uh, is referred to as gen tag, sometimes referred to as tagging compounds. The generator condition monitor will detect overheating in the generator. However, it will not tell you the area in the generator that is overheating. With gen tags are a compound, there's five of them, that are applied to the end windings, the core ID, the rotor OD, and the bushing and lower leads, so that in the event of a alarm and you the generator condition monitor gets an alarm, you automatically collect a sample. A sample of this gas is sent to a lab. We can tell the tagging compound from that laboratory analysis, which tells us the area in the generator that is overheating. Uh, this, this can save uh, sometimes days in trying to locate what the problem was with a generator when it overheats. Thermal degradation in a, or, or thermal breakdown uh, inside a generator or hot spot, uh, it's not subtle. Uh, you, again, you go from zero uh, to going, having millions of these submicron particles. So that gives you a, a, a dramatic signal change in both of these analyzers that I'm going to be discussing. Because a generator is typically sealed, in a hydrogen generator, it's always sealed. In uh, TWAC generators or uh, air and water cooled generators, they're sealed also. It facilitates the location of the hotspot. The particles stay inside the generator, so they're easy to detect. There's only one source for these submicron particles, and that's a thermal breakdown. You can't create these particles by whipping oil off the rotor or an oil mist or a water mist, submicron particles are only created by a thermal event, at least inside a generator. And again, because the generators are typically sealed, there's minimal interference. And minimal mass will give you an early warning. Uh, we, we have run tests where the generator condition monitors a four square inch area or 25.8 uh, centimeter square area will give you a dramatic signal change in the generator condition monitor. First I will discuss the generator condition monitor for hydrogen cooled machines, which I will refer to as a GCMX. And as I stated, this device uses an ion chamber to detect thermal particulation or submicron particles in the generator. This is a PNID of how the GCMX is tied to the generator. The generator located in the upper left hand corner, you can see the middle line coming down that is the inlet to the generator condition monitor. This is the fan pressure side in the generator. So the rotor fan that I spoke of earlier, this is the pressure side of that fan. So the hydrogen is fed. It comes down through an isolation valve. 
There's a drip leg in the line to remove any liquid oil that is in the hydrogen stream. Then it goes through a oil moisture trap, which is there to protect the GCMX. It removes uh, water or oil in a mist from the generator condition monitor. Then it enters into the generator condition monitor, and then it comes as it comes out, it goes through again an oil moisture trap, which is optional. And then a drip, another drip leg, and it returns to the suction side of the generator. I'm asked sometimes why I have a recommend having a drip leg and an oil moisture trap on the outlet of the generator condition monitor since the hydrogen is flowing back towards the generator. Um, and what we've learned over the years that just because the hydrogen is flowing in one direction doesn't mean oil can't flow in the other direction. So we've seen where hydrogen is flowing back to the generator, but oil is flowing back towards the GCMX. So these two drip legs and oil moisture traps are there to protect the GCMX. This is a piping diagram of a, the internals of a GCMX, and I'll explain this. You have the hydrogen gas coming in the flange, the lower flange on the left-hand side. The hydrogen goes to a three-way valve, solenoid valve, which diverts the hydrogen around that filter. And that this is, the filter is very important, and we'll be discussing that later. So the hydrogen comes in, normal operation is diverted around the filter, enters into the ion chamber. We use a differential pressure transmitter to set the flow through the ion chamber. There's a flow set valve on the outlet of the ion chamber to, to set the flow. And then there's the lower flange on the right-hand side is what's connected to the return of the generator. So the pressure side of the fan is connected to the left-hand side lower flange. The right-hand side is the right-hand lower flange is, goes to the suction. In the event that you have an alarm, the upper solenoid valve will open, allowing a path of hydrogen to go through the collector which is downstream of the solenoid valve. This collector has a filter in it. The collector has quick disconnects on it, so it can be removed from the piping schematic, piping, and sent to a lab for analysis. There is a flow meter on the outlet of that so that we know how much hydrogen is going through that collector. And then there's a flange that goes to vent. Everything in this on the piping, the solenoid valves the, and the ion chamber are controlled by electronics, which are housed in an explosion-proof enclosure so that this, can, this system can be put in a hazardous area. All of that is in the explosion-proof enclosure, which is in the lower right-hand uh, part of this slide. This is what the ion chamber looks like. Uh, this device is about three inches in diameter and about 12 inches long. You notice on the left-hand side of this ion chamber, there's a band that goes around that. That's a heater, and it's used to elevate the temperature of the ion chamber above ambient so that Moisture will not form inside of the ion chamber or affect the output of the ion chamber. This is a sectioned view of the ion chamber, and I'm going to explain how this operates. In the left-hand fitting in the ion chamber, this is where the gas comes in. Once the gas is inside the ion chamber, it's diffused, and there is a alpha source inside the ion chamber. The hydrogen picks up these alpha particles which are emitted from the alpha source and it, it essentially carries them between two parallel plates. And these parallel plates, one of them is charged. One of them is negatively charged. And the positively charged alpha particles 
attach themselves to the negatively charged probe. This creates a very small current. And what we do is we take that current, amplify it, and set the output to 80%. If you look in the left-hand side, those, the, the two bar graphs, the first bar graph is flow. You have to have a correct hydrogen flow in order for the ion chamber to work. The second bar graph is the output of the ion chamber, which, again, we set at 80%. We also set a warning level at 70%. It begins to verify an alarm at 50%, and we'll, we'll discuss that in our, our next slide. So in order for the ion chamber to work, you have to have proper hydrogen flow, the ion chamber has to be operating properly, and the electronics have to be operating properly. So if you do not have any of those three conditions, you cannot get the 80%. So w establishing the 80% is an indication that everything is working properly. In the event that you have an alarm, or if you have overheating in the generator, you're creating millions of submicron particles inside the generator. The hydrogen carries these submicron particles into the ion chamber. These submicron particles are very heavy in relationship to the alpha particles. Or, and the alpha particles attach themselves to the heavier submicron particles. So those parallel plates which are on the right-hand side of the ion chamber, instead of the alpha particles attaching themselves to the negative electrode and creating a current, they go right on by because they're attached to the heavier submicron particles. You lose that current, and as you know in the bar graph, the output drops below 50%. So once again, with clean hydrogen, no particles in the hydrogen. I can carry the alpha particles between the two parallel plates, create a current, set the output to 80%. In the event that I'm creating submicron particles in the generator, the hydrogen carries those submicron particles into the ion chamber. We lose our current, and then the output drops below 50%, and we begin to confirm uh, an alarm verification sequence. The way that we verify that the alarm is real is that we that filter that I discussed earlier will remove the particles from the generator. So under normal conditions with clean hydrogen, again, the, the hydrogen will bypass the filter, go into the ion chamber, and we establish that 80% output. In the event that the generator has a hot spot, these particles enter into the ion chamber and cause the current to drop. And then what we do is we insert that filter. We energize that solenoid valve so that the hydrogen now goes through that filter. And the filter removes the submicron particles. When the submicron or particles are removed, the output goes back up to the, the, the normal 80%. Uh, after a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds, the filter is then uh, taken out of the circuit. The particles go back into the ion chamber, and the out ion chamber gives you a verified alarm. Again, once you get a verified alarm, the top solenoid valve is opening. A portion of hydrogen goes through the collector. The collector has a filter in it that grabs a sample that can then be sent to a laboratory to be analyzed to confirm the alarm. If the generator doesn't have tagging compounds, if the generator does have tagging compounds, then the lab will look for that tag to tell you where the area in the generator that's overheating. So the ion chamber or the generator condition monitor has a three-point check to verify the alarm. Again, under normal conditions, it's operating at 80%. A warning comes in at 70%, and the alarm verification sequence begins at 50%. So 
with normal operating, I got 80%. When particles enter, because of a hot spot, it drops below 50%. This energizes the filter. The filter removes the particles. The output returns back above 50%. And then after a given period of time, the filter de-energizes and the it will give you it will drop below 50% giving you a verified alarm so there's a three point check with the generator condition monitor or GCMX to give you an alarm now i'm going to talk about the GCMA this is another piece of equipment used to detect hot spots in generators uh, as i mentioned earlier this will, the GCMA uses a cloud chamber or a Wilson cloud chamber to detect thermal particulation or detect these submicron particles in the generator. This, this type of monitor has become popular in recent years because the output rating of air-cooled generators has grown dramatically. We're, we're now generating megawatts with air-cooled generators that was 15, 20 years ago was only capable of being generated with hydrogen-cooled generators. So they're pushing the design limits of these air-cooled generators, and that's creating a need for a monitor that will detect hot spots in these machines. Even generators with uh, air-cooled generators with closed cooling systems can be contaminated by outside air. Uh, they have makeup air uh, vents on them that will allow air to come into them. For this reason, this monitor used to monitor air-cooled machines must be, first of all, it must be more sensitive. And second of all, we have to monitor the ambient air also. Uh, with hydrogen-cooled generators, because they're sealed, the ion chamber detector is well-suited for detecting submicron particles in, the, in, in a hydrogen-cooled generator. With air-cooled generators, they can be open, we have an open cooling system, and the detection principle employed to, de, to protect them needs to be highly sensitive Yet it's got to be immune to false alarms due to dust and dirt because dust and dirt is more likely to enter, well, it will only enter into an air-cooled generator. It will never enter into a uh, hydrogen-cooled generator. Submicron-sized particles are of great interest because during thermal events, they increase exponentially per second, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation. No other phenomena in the generator will produce particles in such numbers. So there's no, under, no other condition other than a thermal uh, breakdown of material that will cause these particles to be generated in these numbers. Making these minute particles visible and continuously monitoring their concentration provides an ideal means to monitor an air-cooled generator for arcing and overheating. If there is a rapid increase in submicron particles, then you've got a thermal or an arcing event taking place in that generator. So the, the Wilson cloud chamber or, or cloud chamber is an excellent tool in making invisible particles large enough to see. Simply stated, if you quickly cool a highly humidified air sample, the supersaturated air will form water droplets around these submicron particles and it will make the invisible particle visible. It, what it's doing is creating a fog. So invisible particle concentrations become visible, and we can monitor that with the, the cloud chamber. As I mentioned earlier, 
when operating under normal conditions, there are no submicron particles uh, or particulation that's taking place in the cooling gas. When a thermal event takes place, millions of submicron particles are created and enter into the cooling gas. The cloud chamber is a, a very sensitive device that can effectively detect these submicron particles. This is a sectioned view of a cloud chamber. The air sample from the generator and ambient air enters the bottom of this device where it is super saturated. The air sample then flows into the cloud chamber at the top of the device where it is quickly cooled by a sudden increase in pressure. And what this does, it results in droplets of water forming around the submicron particles, making the invisible particles visible, thus affecting the light path from the LED to the photocell. So the output of this photocell is what we're monitoring for the concentration of particles in the generator. In addition to having a more sensitive detector, the GCMA monitors both ambient air and generator cooling air. The reason for this is on air-cooled generators, because some of them are open, some of them have, even the closed ones, have vents that allow cooling air to come into them. If you have a operation taking place outside the generator that could be creating submicron particles, such as a fork truck or a welding operation or someone cutting metal, all of those will create submicron particles. And if we were monitoring the cooling air of the generator only, these could appear as a hot spot in the generator. So what we have to do is monitor the ambient air so that we know what the concentration of the ambient air is before we verify that there's an alarm. The GCMA has three warning and alarm levels that are uh, for the ambient air, for the cooling air, and then there's an alarm and warning level for a differential between the two. And if the generator cooling air signal increases without a corresponding increase in the ambient signal, particles are being generated within the generator. And a differential alarm is confirmed that there's overheat, it's confirmation that there is overheating taking place in the generator. A GCM, the GCMA system consists of the monitor itself, which contains all the electronics, uh, a vacuum pump, a blower is used to create the flows through the unit, and this blower sucks a sample from the ambient air and the generator air. And then the cloud chamber, as we saw in the earlier slide, is used to look for these particles or detect these particles. The GCMA system can, uh, has a, two zone manifolds which are used to filter out larger particles and also used to set the flows through the piece of equipment. Sample piping for this device can be PVC pipe, so the installation is very easy. We usually use sample heads to that are used to collect a sample of the ambient air, and then a sample probe which is inserted into the generator to collect the cooling air. And we'll, we'll, we'll see, uh, you'll see that in the next couple of slides. One of the benefits with a GCMA or monitoring for overheating in an air-cooled generator is you can test the device, you can test the GCMA. Well, what, you, what we do is we take resistors that are coated with insulating paint, we put them in the belly of the generator, and we overheat them. 
and these overheated resistors that are covered with the insulating paint, uh, the insulating paint breaks down, gives off millions of submicron particles, and we detect them. So the GCMA system can be challenged, uh, whereas with a hydrogen-cooled uh, or, or the uh, ion chamber, you cannot uh, challenge that device. Looking at this display, you've got two bar graphs. One is for the ambient air, one is for the cooling air, and then to the right of those you see three sets of, uh, well, you, the, what you see is squares, these are LEDs, and they are the warning and alarm points for the generator cooling air, for the ambient air, and then the differential of the, the two of those, the difference between the cooling air and the ambient air. This next slide is of a open loop cooling system on an air-cooled generator, sometimes referred to as a once-through or once-pass uh, cooling system. And what you have is that gener the cooling air enters a filter housing, and then the, the cooling air is uh, indicated here with these blue arrows. Cooling air enters the filter housing. We've got sensors up there to monitor for the ambient air. The air then circulates through the generator, cools the generator, and comes out the right-hand side where you see the red arrow. And we have he sample heads there to monitor for the cooling uh, air of the generator. So again, if the cooling air or the ambient air sees an increase in particulation and the generator sees an in increase in particulation, you know that it's coming from the outside world, uh, perhaps a welding operation. If the generator cooling air concentration goes up and the ambient air stays down, now you know that the overheating is being created or the particles are being created inside the generator, and that's why the, you're getting the increase in concentration. This next generator is a closed system, sometimes referred to as a TWAC, totally, totally enclosed water-cooled unit. You can see we still monitor the ambient air because many of these type, the, many of the this type of cooling system has a vent that allows air to come into it, uh, make up air. We also, you can see that there's a probe that's down by the heat exchangers, and that's where we're monitoring for the particulation in the generator itself. So here on a, on a once-through system, the sensor has to be very sensitive because you're only getting one shot at detecting that those submicron particles, where in a closed-loop system, the particles will stay in there for a while so it's a little bit sealed, makes it a little bit easier to detect overheating in these units. In summary, both of these units, the GCMX and GCMA, use detectors that are very effective in detecting submicron particles that are created by overheated materials. Both are well suited for the applications they are being used in, and both can help ensure reliable operation of your hydrogen and air-cooled generators, helping to minimize the, the chances of a ca catastrophic generator failure. And, and I'd just like to add that we don't say that this is the only type of detection you should have on your generator. We recommend the more reliable pieces of detection equipment the, the more reliable information that you're giving an operator, the, the better decision an operator can make on whether to continue operation of that generator. Thank you, and I'll turn this back to Rachel. Thank you, Steve. So it is now time for the question and answer section. So thank you to everyone who has already sent their questions in. Please continue to send in your questions via the Q&A widget at the bottom of your screen, or please use the top left-hand box. 
We will try and get through as many of the questions as possible. However, if we do not have time to answer them all in this webinar, then Steve will get back to you at a later date. So for your first question, do you see a continuing trend of high voltage generator cores becoming smaller and the volts per mil insulation being pushed to the limit? Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've attended uh, conferences put on by both Alstom and Siemens, and both are building larger uh, air-cooled generators uh, that, are, that are producing more megawatts. And the quality of insulation is getting better. The cooling techniques in the generators are getting better. Uh, but they, but they're still they're they're still pushing the design limit um, of the the of these pieces of equipment, uh, which makes it more important to be monitoring for overheating and, and other monitors also. But yes, I I can see the trend continuing. Okay, thank you very much. And could you please explain the core plate? Um, the, the, the core plates, now, as, as far as I know, and, and the, that information was provided by a utility that, that ru was running testing on this piece of equipment to test piece, this piece of equipment. Um, the, the, it is the laminations or core laminations that are stacked to make up the core itself. These laminations or punchings are insulated uh, with insulating paint, and that's the, that's what they tested to determine if what that's what I believe they were referring to when they said core plate. They were referring to the laminations that are used to stack and make a uh, generator. Thank you. And I'm assuming that in the air-cooled machines, it is not possible to detect locations within the machine where the hotspot originates. Not yet, but but we're working on that. Uh, we we're we're running tests. Uh, as a matter of fact, we recently have run tests. The u utilizing the tagging compounds inside of a air-cooled generator. Uh, and the trick here is being able to collect a sufficient sample uh, to, to be analyzed. So we, we, we are working on that. We have a prototype auto sampling system for the GCMA that we're working on. And uh, I, I suspect that uh, by year, year's end, we're going to have a uh, uh, a sampling system that will collect the samples in air-cooled generators so that the tagging compounds can be used in air-cooled generators. Okay, thank you. And why do we need GCMX or GCMA if our generator already has RTDs and thermocouples? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, as, as I mentioned when I, when I discussed RTDs and thermocouples, you can have as little as, as few as two or three. And typically they'll monitor the warm gas and hot gas going through the water heat exchanger uh, in a hydrogen cooled machine. If you have a hot spot in your generator, that hot spot has to be very large in order to affect the air temperature or gas temperature in the machine. So unless the thermocouple or RTD is very close to the hot spot, the RTDs or thermocouples aren't going to detect it. Uh, if you got a generator that, even a generator that has 30 or more RTDs or, uh, or thermocouples in the machine, it is possible, very possible, to have a hot spot in that machine that those RTDs or thermocouples uh, are not going to be sensitive enough to recognize that, that overheating. Okay, thank you. And do you have case studies of heating events that were detected and the generator shut down based on the GCM results? 
We, we just had a recent one, as a matter of fact, and we're still gathering data on that. But we do have some case studies uh, or examples of where the piece of equipment did go into alarm. I'll give you one example that uh, rather recently is that a generator come out of an outage. They did some work on the generator. It came out of an outage. They inadvertently did not turn the cooling water on for the hydrogen coolers. So the generator was brought back online. The generator condition monitor was the first indication that they had overheating in that generator. So this, this was a human error where they forgot to turn on the uh, water coolers. But again, the generator condition monitor was the first device to detect that. Uh, I can give an example of a power plant that had back core burning in the generator. And the generator condition monitor was actually used, and this doesn't sound, this doesn't really make sense to me, but the, they would elevate the load of the generator or increase the load of the generator until they got an indication from the, the GCM letting them know that there was some particulation taking place in this case, they knew it was back core burning, and they backed off the load a little bit and operated the generator. Uh, we, we just had a recent one, and we're, we're still collecting data on this, where a, our generator condition monitor went into an alarm, a sample, the generator happened to be tagged, they ran, did the analysis of the sample, the analysis indicated the area of the generator. They opened the ge generator up, and it, it, it's exactly where the hot spot occurred. Thank you very much. And is the capacity of GCMX or GCMA dependent on the size of the generator? No. The, 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 let, me, let me start with the GCMX. The GCMX can be used on any size hydrogen cooled generators. Uh, we have them on generators that are uh, 1200 megawatts, nuclear units that are 1200 megawatts. We have them installed on units as small as 25 and 30 megawatts. So with the GCMX, it, it, the, the, it doesn't matter the size of the generator. With the GCMA, uh, it, it, it really gets down to the value of the generator to the customer and the value of keeping that generator online. But the use of either the GCMX or the GCMA is not generator size dependent. Thank you very much. And what if my GCMX doesn't go to 80% on collaboration? Um, well, the, the one thing I would, first of all, recommend is that whoever asks that question get in touch with our service department, and they'll walk you through that. <clears throat> there, can be, there can be different things that uh, the ion chamber can be contaminated with oil or water. Uh, the electronics in the unit might not be working. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the confirmation filter uh, may be contaminated. So there, there are different conditions that could cause this to happen, I would recommend that they get in touch with E1, uh, the, the USB service group, and they can walk them through how to resolve that issue. Okay, thank you very much. And what is the approximate cost and lead time associated with having the lab analysis done after an alarm event? Well, Environment One is one of the labs that perform this service. And and I, I'm, I'm going to throw out ballpark numbers here. For a routine analysis that we turn around in two to four weeks, it, it, uh, the price of that is about $1,000. We also have an, what we refer to as an emergency analysis service, and we'll turn those around. We, we stay in writing 24 hours. In reality, we turn them around in eight, eight hours from when we receive them. And they're about double the cost. They're about $2,000 to have the, an emergency analysis done. Thank you very much. And what kind of maintenance is required on these systems, and how frequently does that maintenance need to be carried out? Another good question. On the GCMX, 
the GCMX has, with the exception of the solenoid valves, has no moving parts. So it's a very reliable piece of equipment with minimal uh, maintenance required. As a matter of fact, when I do a startup or commissioning or a training, what I will typically recommend is that they do a, either a walk-by uh, on, a, on a per shift basis or on a daily basis just to verify that the flow and the calibration are within their ranges. Uh, typically, they don't have to recalibrate or readjust the flow. I, I recommend this just so that they're paying attention to the piece of equipment because the GCMX is very much a fit and forget piece of equipment. It gets installed because you don't have generator problems every day. It gets ignored. So uh, when there is an issue, a lot of times there there will be questions: What is this thing doing, and what should I be? What what action should I take? In? So I recommend with the GCMX a daily walk by to verify that the flow in the output, the ion chamber output, is correct. Uh, the GCMA does require a little bit more maintenance. It, it does have uh, moving parts in it. It is also a reliable piece of equipment. However, it uses distilled water. So water has to be added to this, to the unit. Depending on the location, uh, it will depend on how frequently the water has to be added to the unit. Uh, and when I say the location, the ambient uh, location. So with, an air, with a water air-cooled generator condition monitor, you have to add water typically every three months. Again, I recommend a, a, a per-shift walk-by of the piece of equipment just to verify that there's no trouble indication and that the outputs are reading where the output should be reading. Okay, thank you very much. And how much fan differential pressure is required for proper flow through the GCMX? The, the GCMX uh, will, you, will require in the neighborhood of four to five. In the United States, we use inches of water. Four to five inches of water is required for operation. In Europe, uh, that would be 102 to 127 millimeters of water uh, for proper operation. You'll find with some generator manufacturers, and I won't name them, but some have a low differential pressure. And then there's others that, for, that use, for instance, a, a blower instead of a fan has a, an extremely high differential pressure. Uh, usually, we do not run into issues Regarding the uh, differential pressure and having a sufficient differential pressure to operate the units, however, uh, that is one of the things, one of the first questions that we will ask a potential user is, what is your fan differential pressure? So that we know that it's uh, sufficient to operate this piece of equipment. And by the way, the, the GCMA requires no uh, fan differential pressure because it is sucking air with a blower out of the generator uh, to be sampled. Thank you. And how small of a hotspot will the GCMA or GCMX detect? We've run tests where we've overheated resistors, both in hydrogen and air-cooled generators. Uh, you won't find many hydrogen people who own uh, hydrogen-cooled generators that will allow you to overheat resistors, but there have been several utilities that have done this. And we've taken resistors that are coated with insulating paint uh, with an area of approximately four square inches or 25.8 square centimeters. And we've, uh, it's, and with a GCMX, it has dropped the output from 80% down to 10%. With the GCMA, which operates at a lower, it starts with a low output and goes up with concentration. Uh, we, we've gone from background noise of approximately 5% up to 100%. Uh, so with uh, Again, with an area of four square inches or 25.8 uh, 
square centimeters. Okay, and I think we have time for just one more question. So does the GCMA require a fan differential pressure for proper flow? No, and I, I, I answered that a little bit earlier, but no, the GCMA does not require fan differential pressure for operation. We use a blower to suck a sample from the GCMA and bring it, suck it from the generator to the GCMA. And by the way, we, we have the contact information for all of the rest of these questions. Rachel, I don't know if you were going to mention this, but we will answer all of these questions. Uh, we will email or get the answer to, these, uh, to the questions that have been asked. Okay, yes, perfect. So we have also had a lot of people asking how they can access the on-demand version of this session. So you will receive an email shortly telling you how you can access this on-demand version, or you can access this through our website, which is www.business-review-webinars.com. So sadly, that is all we have time for in today's session. So if we didn't get around to answering your question, then Steve will get back to you at a later date. And um, so that just leaves me to thank Steve for what was a great presentation. And thanks to Environment One uh, Corporation for sponsoring this session. Uh, we look forward to sharing further webinars with you. So please do keep an eye out on the websites I just mentioned. And follow us on Twitter at BR Webinars for daily updates. And join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars. So thank you once again to everyone. And I hope you all have a nice day.